Wonderful. All right, let's go ahead and begin. Thank you all so much for coming today. Our 25th anniversary of DPN uh, is, has a panel today focusing on the woman's experience of, DFPN, of DEPN. And this is a wonderful opportunity for us to see from their perspectives. I'm going to introduce our main presenter today, and he will take the stage in just a moment. This is Octavian Rob Robinson, who's going to be joining us. And he'll talk to us about what his presentation is going to be about. But I did want to introduce him and let you know that he actually graduated from Gallaudet. He is a Gallaudet alumni. He earned his bachelor's degree in uh, Deaf Studies and also earned his doctoral degree from Ohio State University. He studied women's history, focusing specifically on Deaf people's citizenship, economic citizenship, and published a few articles on Deaf history and Deaf women's history. While doing his dissertation studies, he actually is working on turning that into a book, which will hopefully be published for us to read uh, shortly. He's now at the Maryland School for the Deaf. He was the most recent coach of the winning Academic Bowl team from Maryland School for the Deaf, and it is our pleasure to give a warm welcome. I know it's more important for you to see me. In 1837, in, uh, Ohio, Ohio opened their doors to women for the first time. Now, women who were going there had equal educational access, or they did not. Uh, what they did was have ladies' courses, and those ladies' courses were not standard courses. The expectations were not nearly as high as they were for men, and they didn't have the same coursework. Uh, their courses focused on what we would call domestic uh, skills. You know, duties as a wife and a mother were the focus of their degrees. So they had courses in cooking and sewing and good moral development. So that was Oberlin College. They were the first co-ed institution. Now we did have a few other schools and institutions that were for women only, but they were very limited in number. By 1870, we saw about 1.7% of women in America engaged in higher education. By 1848, there was a women's rights convention in Seneca Falls in upstate New York. And at that meeting, there was a lot of people who talked about voting rights, but they did also address other concerns and issues, especially related to higher education and women's place in society. At the convention, they declared that women's education was limited. And they also said that in order for women to have a greater place in society, it was known that they needed to have thorough education. If women succeeded at women's only institution, they would never succeed otherwise. So there was a call for really having co-educational environments and having the courses and expectations be applied equally to both groups. After that convention, there was indeed an increase in women participating in higher education. After the Civil War, we saw even a greater expansion of colleges accepting women into their universities. Now, there was a lot of resistance, even though there was some increase, and it was fierce. There was a number of different responses to women's desire to go to college. Uh, those responses were from scholars, from peers, from classmates, and they all argued against women coming into higher education. Some of their points were that this could cause serious medical issues for women, and their brains were about five ounces smaller than, bren than men's brains. And if they went into higher education and engaged in all that serious work, they, it would result in insanity and feeble-mindedness and physical problems, and even uterine infections and complications and disorders, and, and infertility would be caused by going to college. So women would not be able to have children. So there was a lot of belief that would adversely affect women's health. But of course, 
it was known that it was best for women to do that, and that was argued back, and they needed to let women into the colleges and universities. Now, there was another group of people who were, we talked about those medical workers, but another group was concerned that it would cause social unrest. Uh, because if you see how women are in a political or a military environment, it caused social unrest. And they thought that there were very traditional ways that women should participate in society and men should participate in society. So what was left for women who didn't want to engage in those domestic activities? Taking care of society in general? There were those health issues, those social disruption issues were the big reasons that people used to keep women out of colleges and higher universities and higher education. Now the argument persisted for quite some time, mind you. The arguments persisted. But those colleges could read the white writing on the wall and they knew that things needed to change. So what they did was set up what was called adjunct colleges. And so these were colleges that were associated with larger colleges and universities such as Harvard and Radcliffe being their adjunct. So when women wanted to come into their institution, they said, oh no, don't come here, you can go to our adjunct. So Bren Mawr was uh, set up at that time, Radcliffe, Bernard, all of those were those such institutions with the intent of avoiding having women come into the men's only educational institutions. Nonetheless, women continued to struggle against these uh, objections. And then we did see later, 70% of women who were higher education were in co-educational institutions with men. Now they did have coursework that had similar standards, or that was the wish, but that was not always the case, and the progress was slow towards that end. Now there were some women who were fighting for access to hearing education, the hearing women. Deaf women didn't stand by and just let that happen. They stood up for their rights and fought their, for their rights as well. In 1864, when Gallaudet opened its doors, it invited both men and women into the university. Now, women who came in at that time tended not to graduate. They would come in, they would stay for a couple of years, and then they would leave. They'd come again and then leave again. Now, historians feel that that case that that happened is because they did not have enough support systems for, for them here. They didn't have extracurricular activities. They didn't have proper facilities for them and so forth. And it was a hostile environment for women. They were not uh, seen as equal at all. They were seen as second-class citizens. By 1871, EMG himself decided that women don't succeed here, so we are no longer going to admit them, and he closed the doors to them. And they were closed for 22 years. There was no deaf woman admitted for 22 years. Now, there was a reaction to that, and deaf women did fight and send letters and the LPFs, the Little Paper Families, wrote a great deal about that and objected to that. And they called for the rights of deaf women to be educated. And they said that Gallaudet needs to be a place for both deaf men and women. They said that hearing women now have lots of opportunities and Gallaudet needs to provide an equivalent opportunity. It had gotten to the point where women were actually donating money to establish their own college as a response to those male-only colleges. There was one woman in California who made a $5 donation to start that fund. At that time, $5 was a significant amount of money. This was back in the 1880s. <coughs> so there was a lot of communication going towards, uh, going to EMG. In 1885, the Western Society of um, said that we, of, of women in college, we know that there are no ill health effects, we know that there's no social unrest, and we demand to be allowed into the college. At the same year, deaf women were, again, talking with EMG and 
saying we needed to be let in. But EMG's uh, response to that is we don't have facilities, we don't have housing, we don't have a proper cafeteria for you, so we cannot take you, and we don't have money for any of those things. Now, it just so happened that Congress had given some money to Gallaudet for capital improvements, for a new gym and a new pool, which was a wonderful perk, which at the time was the old gym, by the way. And the women called him on that, and they said, you seem to have enough funds to build a new gym. What about education for deaf women? Eventually, he conceded, and he let women back into the university in 1886. Now, it was not easy at that time, and, it was, and they weren't admitted uh, freely. It was a pilot to see if it would be successful, and in 89, EMG decided that women would be allowed at Gallaudet University heretofore. There was a first woman who graduated with a Bachelor's of Philosophy degree, Ottoman is her last name, and then Agatha Teagle graduated with a BA degree soon after that in 1893. So women were here to say, they proved they to stay, they proved that. In 86, it was not easy. They were here, but it was a lot of struggle. There was a lot of sexism. There was a lot of resistance and oppression and marginalization of women students here on campus. They, again, were seen as second-class citizens. Often, if uh, men and women were waiting in the cafeteria, they were harassed, they were teased, they were exposed to inappropriate comments. And, you know, the men had lots of different groups, the drama club, the literary club, and so forth, but women were not invited. If they were to be included, they had to be specifically invited by one of the members, which was male, and then they had to be chaperoned. And if they then came into those uh, meetings, they were asked to sit in the back and be quiet. Again, very much second-class citizens here on Kendall Green. And the women suffered through that. They persevered. They did not take it easily. They fought back. They continued to fight. Issues were shared in valedictorian speeches. They were shared in cartoons and in articles and in dialogue. There were a lot of different ways that women expressed their resistance and expressed their critique to climbing the social ladder here on Kendall Green. So they actively resisted that oppression. In that resistance also included an organization called LWLS. It was founded by 15 women who had came together who said that we don't want to go to the men's literary meetings anymore and we don't want to sit in the back of the room. We want to be involved with theater and we want to engage in intellectual uh, dialogue. We want to have an intellectual life. So in 1892, Agatha Siegel was the pre first president of that organization. They are responsible for starting the Buff and Blue, by the way. The women decided to go ahead and have a newspaper. They did not have an editorial role, however. They deferred it to the men, and they ran it. Uh, it was not until 1910 that they had a woman editor. It was also the Owls that established a women's basketball team, which preceded the men's basketball team by eight years. So they had their own sports team, their own literary groups, and lots of other activities. They took it upon themselves to make it happen. They still eh, saw racism and oppression, and that has survived right through the 20th century. However, we know that women are here to stay forever at Gallaudet and at Kendall Green. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Octavian, for for your for sharing that information with us today. <coughs> we would now like to go ahead and introduce our three panelists and our moderator as well. Let me see who we're going to start off with. I'd like to begin by introducing Dr. Jane Norman, who is again an alumni of Gallaudet. 
She earned her PhD in communications from Harvard University, excuse me, from Howard University, and has been heavily involved in uh, deaf theater and uh, various deaf groups here in America and across the United States. <coughs> she was involved in Deaf Way One and Deaf Way Two, the National Theater for the Deaf, the Deaf Mosaic, and she also received various awards uh, and Emmys for the work that they were doing. She was also the producer and director of the World Deaf Film Festival here at Gallaudet in 2010, and she currently is the director of the Gallaudet University Museum. Welcome, Jane, we're thrilled to have you. Now I'd like to introduce Jackie Roth, who is another alumni of Gallaudet University. She's had a number of jobs throughout her career here, including entertainment, education, law, advocacy, and is currently involved in real estate. She was actually the, uh, in, in, she played the character of Sarah Norman in Children of a Lesser God and toured nationally. She produced Sound and Fury. I think you probably remember that PBS production a few years ago. And she's also been a member as well as president of various national boards, including president of Deaf Women United. She's currently vice president of Illumin in New York, which is a real estate agency in New York City. It is also my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mary Keene. She earned her master's degree from NYU She started working at EPOC here on campus, which is now the Career Center. And she worked as coordinator of residence education for 10 years. She most recently earned her, her doctoral degree in special education administration, and she's still working as the campus activities director. So thank you, three women, for being on our panel. And last but not least, I would like to introduce our first lady, Vicki Hurwitz. Vicki has been heavily involved with the deaf women and the deaf community. She's studied deaf women's history. And she actually started a course at NTID in deaf women's history and taught that course as well. She's been involved with Deaf Women of Rochester, Deaf Women United, and has served as ex executive director and then later president for Deaf Womenism. So it is our pleasure to have Vicki here to moderate our panel, and I'd like to invite Vicki and our panelists to the stage at this time. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction, Isabella. To be here and to moderate this pan panel today, I first would like to mention that Pat Johansson was not able to join us as was planned for family reasons. But I would like to go ahead and get us started with our questions if all of our panelists are ready. So first of all, let's start off by asking where you were during DPN and what was your job at that time? I'll start. While I was working here uh, at the time, uh, it was the Gallaudet, I was the director for the Gallaudet Regional Centers. That was so long ago, I'm trying to remember right. Gallaudet Regional Center Director. And when the whole thing happened and kind of broke out, um, you know, the whole campus was a mess after we found out that uh, Zinzer was elected, a hearing woman was going to become the next president of the Gallaudet University. We were happy that it was a woman, okay? But we, had, we knew we had those two finalists who were deaf, so we were curious about why the hearing woman was chosen. And a lot of people had strong feelings about that. 
And they started to talk about it and complain about it. And then the newspapers and press descended upon the campus and started to ask people questions. And there were all kinds of comments going out from the campus and there was no coordination. They didn't know how to use the media at the time. You know, there were newspaper reporters and cameras all over the campus. So what happened was, is I had just moved back to Washington, D.C. from California. And I had worked a lot with media and PR and all that kind of stuff. So I was kind of drafted by the woman to my left and said, look, you know how to do this. You know how to handle media. Come over here and help out. I said, OK. So we ended up on the same team, Jane and I. And uh, we did start to work directly with those four students. I became their coach, so to speak. And those four students, by the way, uh, were chosen in really just a, not in a very deliberate way. There were three men and there was one uh, woman, and I'll, I'll stop here, but basically, you know, I worked with those four leaders throughout the whole week. I worked with the newspapers, the television, I was involved with interviews and all of that. Well, at that time I was teaching uh, here at Gallaudet in the TV department, and I was also uh, earning my doctoral degree at Howard University, and of course, on communication, uh, specifically communication with media, and how the media defines deaf people, you know, how the media defines what a deaf person looks like. So that's what I was studying, was how the media portrays that and how people learn from that portrayal. So while I was attending class, uh, and, and a number of different classes there at Howard, uh, I was also staying informed on the events of what was leading up to uh, Gallaudet in terms of who they were going to choose for their president, the final three candidates that were uh, being debated. And I wrote a small paper at that time, and I was actually predicting that they would choose the hearing woman before the board would ever choose a deaf man to be president of the university. That was the prediction that I made. And I had a number of classmates that were in agreement with me on that. Howard uh, was a mostly black university, and the students there were very familiar with oppression and discrimination and all that goes along with that. So indeed, my prediction was proven right. And the students at Howard University uh, and the employees and professors, uh, so uh, in, in short, I was a student at Howard University and a professor here at Gallaudet. In 87, I had just started working. And I remember they were talking about the new president and whether the new president would be deaf or hearing. I was working in an office, by the way, where all my coworkers were hearing. And so I didn't feel a whole lot of support. It was a confusing time for me. And I think staff were afraid for their jobs. And there were lots of different perspectives. You know, you were very involved. I was more behind the scenes. Um, I was working with the internship programs in the Career Center at that time. I'd like to know, um, to what extent were you involved with the deaf president now? And what did you do specifically? And then also, why? If you wouldn't mind, I'd actually like to answer that question. You know, as I just said, I was atta attending Howard, U Howard University, and my classmates and I were engaged in discussion around this. And we could see the upheaval starting. You know, we were trying to encourage the faculty to call a meeting, and the faculty were unsure about doing that, and, and they finally did indeed decide to come together. And, and I believe they met in this very room that we're in right now. It was, it was right here. On very stage. Right, right here on this very stage. Uh, if the walls could talk, my goodness. But we did, uh, the faculty did come together here. And I actually brought a friend of mine, Waki Muzmal from Howard University, uh, who was one of my classmates. And through the protest, um, you know, I had already experienced uh, a protest previously, and so I brought this friend with me. Uh, you know, I dragged her along with, I asked if she would come. And I talked about the fact that we had had impact. We were already on the front page of the New York Times. And so wa for Wakila, it was a question of what do we do now? And she delivered a message that she said simply what we do 
is stop the system. We pull the emergency brake on the system. That was her message. Stop everything. Stop classes. Stop the support. Stop everything that was happening. So that was one way that I was involved. I was also involved, uh, let's see. Gallaudet had two PR camps. Uh, there was the Gallaudet PR camp and then also the DPN uh, PR camp. And I was involved as P uh, PR manager there for the DPN camp. And I knew that there was only one person on earth that I could work with, and that was this woman right here. I knew that Jackie brought so much with her. I knew other talented women as well, and we had uh, hearing women who were able to sign that were able to work with us as well. We would go with Joker Anderson to the bar, and Nancy Connors as well. Uh, and we were all focusing on the press. We were talking about the TV and the radio press that was coming out of this. And they were truly a dynamic team. The media didn't even have a chance with them. What about you, Jackie? Remind me what your question was. What was that? What was my exact role? Right. Right, how were you involved as a participant? As I said, I worked with those four students. Now, again, when it first broke out, in the first day, it was very chaotic. The second day is when we met here, and I do remember that very well. Right here, and we all were asking ourselves, what next? It was disorganized. Everyone was saying one thing and then a different thing. And that's uh, dangerous when you're working with media. You have to have unified thought. You have to have a clear message about where we're going, and it needed to be shared. Of course, everybody has a right to have their own opinion, but we had uh, the goal and objectives needed to be articulated, and they needed to be shared in a singular voice. Why was it we wanted a deaf president? What was that about? And what were we ready to do in order to get that goal met? People wanted to hear from older people, not particularly. They didn't want to hear from students. They didn't, you know, they didn't want to hear from, the media wanted to hear from the students because they knew the students are the voice of tomorrow and the students are the voice of the deaf community. Us old folks were fairly insignificant. Okay, so there, there were the four kids who didn't have that kind of background or knowledge in media, so that was my role. I did work with the council um, and that was mostly faculty and staff, the official media body who did uh, leave the protest movement. And they would fill me in on what the agreements were and what needed to happen again, because we wanted to be unified. So, and every day it changed a little bit. But our four demands did not change. They were consistent. So we had those four students, and we put their faces out representing what it is that we were thinking as a group and what we wanted to achieve. So. Every morning what we did was Connie would go ahead and take care of the press and then I would take care of TV. You all remember the Nightline uh, interview with Greg Leibach, okay? I actually went with Greg to New York City. Uh, we were on Nightline. I was standing in the wings making sure that, you know, he knew exactly what to say. Actually, sorry to correct you. Uh, I was on Nightline with Greg Leibach and uh, Gary Olson, Olson as well and Greg's brother here in D.C. I no, think I flew to New York. No, I think Nightline happened here. I think what you're thinking of is the Today Show. Uh, there, was a, there was a different show that you went to New oh, York for. I yeah. mean, we had a number of different interviews going on at that time. See, it's been 25 years. And there was a lot of shows that I were involved with. So, but at the very beginning, they elected their own leader, you know. And Greg was kind of given that role, and it was easier to have a single face at, in the front of everybody. Yet, each of them had different characteristics and personalities. And my job was creating a rap sheet. You know what that is? It's, I would say, every morning, I would say, what is our message for today? And I would hand it out to everybody so we all had the same message, including faculty and staff, in case a reporter caught them and asked them a question. I didn't want them to be ill-prepared either. So that was my job, essentially, uh, and that was it through the end. And she did a marvelous job at that. Absolutely, they did an outstanding job. 
There was a lot going on with DPN, and I, I was helping sort of behind the scenes. Uh, we held uh, meetings in uh, the conference room in my area. I was providing copies of paperwork that everyone needed. So really just being there to support and help out as needed on a daily basis. Yes, I was involved. I believed in the mission. I believed that we needed a deaf president. And I didn't know about Zinzer as a selection. I thought it was time, and I was supportive of it, absolutely. If you could just pick one or two things that is most significant for you, most memorable during that week, and also tell, tell us why. I think it was Nightline, you know, I was at home. I was watching that. That interview with Marley Matlin, where she was arguing with, who was it? I forget, who was the guy's name? It was a couple, or I don't know. They really were having it out, and it was very, very powerful. And I thought they did a really amazing job, and that stands out for me. It really, really does. Okay, say why. Why does that stand out for you? I can't say it was so powerful. I knew that the whole nation was watching this. And the second one was here, in this room with Jane. Uh, I really, that, that stands out, that first meeting, and I knew I was standing in support after that. So th th those are the two salient ones. I'm sure there are many, many other really significant moments. How about you? I'd say we won. <laughs> that, for me, was the most important thing that happened. Uh, really, the dynamics were very interesting throughout the entire week. Uh, there were a number of different dynamics going on at the same time. We had the gender issue, sort of, but I think what was most important there was that we just saw the entire community come together unified uh, with a common goal and in agreement with each other, and we won. Uh, you know, that was truly the most thrilling moment of the entire week. Truly, I'd say it was an amazing time. We had seven or eight days that were a roller coaster. You know, there were ups and downs throughout the entire week. Uh, and every single morning, you know, we just hoped that there wasn't going to be a national disaster or anything that would sort of pull the, the focus away from us or the rug out from underneath us because it was just a rolling machine that we kept building upon. And it became a sophisticated machine very quickly. The media loved the students. They loved the story. They believed in us. And we were finally able to grow a voice and to develop an identity and to have a common denominator that underlied every single thing we were doing. And that was that we were all deaf. Sure, we might have been women. We might have had gender issues happening. We might have had race coming in there in, in certain pieces. Absolutely, that was happening. But the common denominator that united us all was the fact that we were deaf and we had come together in that identity and showed it nationally. I think it was truly a moment for our allies, for, our, for men as allies for us as well. It was a moment for attention to be brought to us. We had interpreters there who were giving their time for us, that were coming to support and join us and work with us. It was truly inspirational, the entire piece, that we were able to come together powerfully and show the world, show the media who we were. It was an incredibly powerful moment for us all. I remember seeing that, and I was so impressed. I remember there was one press conference where the four leaders uh, were here, and Dr. Sussman was here as well. That was a powerful moment, too. Do you remember that press conference? I, I do. I think I mean, we had a number of press conferences. I think we also gained international attention, too. You know, it started very local and then just built from there. And the world knew what was happening with us. And we made a lot of front pages in a lot of places. It was a big thing. Even at that time, maybe not today, but at that time, if you said DPN, people knew what you were talking about. They really had a positive and healthy impact on the world with this for deaf people everywhere. We were finally heard for the very first time. 
You know, we were a silent minority. Many of you have heard that before. And in this moment, we were no longer silent. Absolutely. Would you like to add to that, Jane? You're right. I think we broke the sound ceiling. In fact, we shattered it. And we were able to really move as a result of that. Yes, I, t I do agree with that. Now, next question. All of the ducks were male, and we've talked about that. But with the student leaders, we had three men, and there was one woman. So clearly, the movement was male-dominated. Uh, what was the place of women in the movement, and how were student leaders selected? If you don't mind, I'll go ahead and answer that, too. Um, the four student leaders were chosen by the seven ducks. And they really led that process. And they're wonderful people, okay? They led this, and there were brains behind it, and there were plans and strategies. And they identified those four students, and they understood that it wouldn't look right if they were all men. They were conscious about that. So they consciously went out of their way to make sure that one of them was a woman who happened to believe that it was very important to have a woman as a president. Okay, so she very, support, she very strongly supported that idea. So Dr. Alan Sussman and Dr. Roz Rosen spent some time with her and talked with her. Brigida Bourne Furl, uh, who was very sharp and very articulate. And she stood strong in her beliefs and she felt like it was the right time to have a woman talked about this in depth and eventually she signed on she was going to sign on to we needed a deaf president and that's when she was added however they were all white uh, but there was that woman representation for the most part during the movement women were expected to provide support while the other isms that were taking place they kind of fell to the wayside because there was a core focus, and that was our deaf experience. That's what tied our lives together, that's what tied our future together, and we needed to do it now, and we needed to do it here. We didn't know when we were gonna have an opportunity to do that again, and we knew we needed to seize the moment. I've given some thought to this question, and I'd actually like to take a step back for a moment if I can. It is important to recognize that this movement was about deaf people. That was the common denominator that everyone ha said. And as, gender, uh, as Jane mentioned, gender, uh, color of skin, all of those other isms were put to the side, and it was about being deaf. However, after this moment, it's a little bit of a different story. If we look back, we can see that there were a number of women leaders during the mo movement that were overlooked. You know, as I was riding the train to come here today, I was thinking about my experience uh, in education and, and thinking about how we have gender-specific uh, sports teams within schools. Uh, the male students typically start in sports teams at a younger age, and they learn camaraderie and sportsmanship from each other at a very young age, but, the, but female students often aren't involved in that. And that camaraderie and sportsmanship really becomes an alliance between those male students. And, when they, and it continues when they enter college, when they get into the workplace, when they're involved in politics. They know how to come together and support each other and work together, I think, better than, than women do. And then women know how to support each other because they don't have that foundational experience that's shared as men are. And I think that in DPN it was, it was put to the wayside. It wasn't looked as women helping other women. It wasn't uh, about that. Their work wasn't acknowledged. Uh, but there were women leaders there. They, women led the media. They also helped the men to look at issues in a very specific way. So women were behind the scenes in that. Um, but there was not a coming together, a sense of, of women being on the same team. And, and I think it's a different dynamic because of that. 
I think after DPN, that underlying foundation of the deaf experience uh, became less of the focus and it did become more about gender or those other isms. As a community, I think even now, uh, I'm not involved in the deaf field anymore. I work again in real estate, uh, which is a complete divergence from my previous experiences. But I do see how often men and women are in how they interact with each other and, and how men become the strong players because of their experiences. And <coughs> men can fight, they can disagree, they can, they can really uh, go at each other in a conversation, but afterwards be fine with it and go out and have a drink and get along just fine. Whereas women hold on to that experience and, and get emotional about it and have a harder time letting it go. I think that's, that's true, I think we see that often. So it's really about behavior. And I could talk about this all night long, I won't, but I absolutely could because I'm fascinated by it and I'm interested in looking into this. And I think that during the movement, yes, the underlying core experience was about being deaf. But I think that it was the men who received the accolades and the recognition and the, the publication. And the women who were involved did not receive that. And that's very unfortunate. I agree with both of your comments. Uh, there were a lot of women out there making it happen, and that's true. All of the other issues were put to the wayside with that core focus, and those issues did come back as issues after the movement. Now, when you talk about the face of the protest, the face was a white deaf man, okay? It was a white deaf male protest. That was the face presented to the world. And there were a lot of issues between gender, between race groups, between hearing and deaf people, and many of those issues are still alive on this campus today. Now, if we're speaking about women, we have to recognize Dr. Mary Maltz Kuhn in this movement. She is often referred to as the mother of DPN because those four student leaders studied under Dr. Maltz Kuhn. So we have to give honor to her. And I'm also sorry that Dr. Roz Rosen is not able to join us today because her view and her assessment of this movement is critical. I actually don't agree with you. I don't think that the face of this was male. I think the face of this was four students. But they didn't use Brigitta as much as they could have, I don't think, as the face of this. And I think that she wasn't as comfortable being in front of the camera. That's one reason for it. Uh, she wasn't comfortably being quoted all the time. Uh, she was okay with it on occasion, but not as comfortable as the other students. And so as the four of these students got involved, uh, and as I was working with them as a, as a coach, uh, as they worked with the media, we could see who had the strength in terms of being in front of the media. Uh, Greg Leibach was very well liked. He was very well received. Uh, and you know, it's like they say in the movies, you either have it or you don't. Uh, you know, you can't teach this overnight. And Greg seemed to really get it and, and be able to incorporate it. Covell, uh, not as much, and then Raris, uh, even less so. And unfortunately, Brigetta was the, the least comfortable with it, and she was the only woman uh, that was a student leader. Greg was the SPG president at the time. Am I right about that? Right. Greg also had his brother there with him who was supporting him a lot, and I think that the Leibach family really uh, came together to support him. Um, and his brother was one of the seven ducks as well. Now, Jerry Covell had the spirit and the fire. You know, he really had the fire for this. And I would say Sam Raris was, was the thinker, the strategizer. Uh, he, he had the fire for it, but he was really thinking about the strategies behind it. And th the four of them were the perfect combination. And our, our female leader maybe didn't say as much, but she was cautious. She, at a very young age, was aware, uh, very aware of the multitude of things happening at the time. And so having, and I, when I said the face of the protest, I, I didn't mean to the media, but I think that I meant to the people who were involved in the protest. It was led by seven white deaf men. So now we mentioned Brigitta uh, as one of the four female student leaders. Did having her as a student leader help to uh, raise the cause of women on campus? 
Did it help raise a different level of awareness or a different level of thinking? I think she was really instrumental in cheerleading uh, other students. They really looked to her. There were a lot of students who uh, felt very comfortable with her. And she was in support of the protest and the movement, even after initial resistance. So she got students report, support, and she was able to give them some comfort while the three guys did not. They were not able to do that. So I guess, you know, that female role kind of played out a little bit in that way in this situation. Well, that leads to another question. Um, about that time, were you... When, when you were all thinking and planning and doing all that, were you as women invited into that process? No, no we weren't. Were, were they encouraging, were other people encouraging their thoughts and ideas and with you all? I'm just asking you. Well, the council was kind of half men and half women, right? My recollection was that there was a on the council, but it was damn hard to get the men's attention. <laughs> it was just damn hard to get their attention. They, you know, as I said, it was led by deaf men, and it really was. And perhaps that was appropriate for the time. <laughs> but I'd say it was, you know, there were daily meetings happening, and so many different ideas coming to the fore, and so many different views being shared, and it was all important. Um, but it definitely was not easy for the deaf women to get the attention of those deaf men at that time, uh, especially on the council. It was a little bit easier for Dr. Roz Rosen, I'll say that. I think that she probably at the time had, um, let's see, she was the highest administrative, she was the highest administrative female position held on campus. Uh, so right. it was easier for her, uh, comparatively, I would say, in terms of getting the attention of the men and getting her point across. Do either of you have thoughts you'd like to share? You know, to be honest, I don't remember a lot of that. Um, as I said, uh, we, my life was about the four students. That was it, the four students and the media to make sure that schedules were in place, the message was out there. So I was working with both men and women. Now, the council was the the daily drive behind the movement itself, that is true. And how they operated on a daily basis, I wasn't really part of that. I would check in and see what the news was, see what the agenda was, that was really all I was interested in, and then I left and did my work, you know. Um, now, uh, Jane, you had a lot more involvement with them at that level, I believe. Right, uh, I think it came from whatever the decision was of the DPN Council was then uh, brought to me and then shared with you and your job was to follow through on that. That's why I said I wasn't familiar what happened uh, internally there. Now let me say this, the first day I did look at the council and there were staff and faculty and they were all men and they were standing there talking to media and presenting lots of mixed messages. Now they did listen to me mind you, when I said, listen, we can't be doing this anymore. We need to have a unified voice. They did respond to me. They realized that they didn't know what they were saying, and I had to say, whoa, everybody slow down. We all need to be on the same page, or we will not win. That was a really key message to get to them, and they bought it. They understood it, okay? Um, now, in other ways, that, that wasn't, so there were other ways that they did not lead. I was the leader there. For my part, it was uh, more about just achieving the goal, and I wasn't really thinking about women's issues or anything else, nothing else. Now, in terms of the, and I was thinking about what the potential impact was of winning this and what the impact would be of future employment for deaf people. Do you notice any, uh, any evidence, uh, be it overt or otherwise, on this campus of sexism Oh, absolutely. I can clearly say yes. There was autism, there was sexism, there was <coughs> racism. It, it's a huge issue. Let's focus on sexism for now. 
I, I mean, it's hard to separate it out. It's all so intermingled. I mean, there's a huge pay gap. There's a disparity between what men and women earned. Uh, it's huge. You know, I worked uh, on the financial committee, and so I was very aware of that pay gap. Uh, racism and sexism, I think, were the most obvious. We had white men in management positions. Almost every administrative position was a white male, and they earned more money, so absolutely. Now, I don't think that I saw racism as much. I think that perhaps that really came to the fore afterwards, not during the movement. I think it was a smaller piece then. Um, now, we did not include people of color. We didn't. Uh, but I don't know that it was an issue. It, it didn't feel as, it as if it was to me. Okay, let's stick to the sexism topic. I don't think it was blatant. I don't think there was blatant sexism. I think there were a lot of old traditions. You know, old habits die hard, and men were just used to being in control, and it, it was a male-dominated society. And they weren't often challenged by women. You know, oftentimes women just followed their lead and still do to this day. <laughs> I see your expression over there, Vicki. I see you. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think that even today, you know, if we had, we have perhaps stronger deaf women now than we did at that time. I think perhaps that was a point of a breakthrough for, for deaf women. Again, the racism piece, I think, really came into play afterwards. Um, and during the, sec the second protest, I think it was much more an issue, but not so much during, that, during DPN. Mary, do you want to share anything? Again, I think it, we knew it was there, but we didn't talk about it. We didn't really think about it much. I think in retrospect, we've analyzed a lot of this, but it was not part of the discourse during that week. It was there and it existed, but it was not a focus. Um, it just wasn't something we talked about at the time. I think we were too engaged in the tasks and being very busy. I'd like to go back to that. Um, in 1893, Agatha Teagle gave a presentation entitled the intellect of women. Okay. And her message was that women tended to be comfortable in the same realm. That women did the same things over and over and over again. And once a woman steps out of her predetermined realm, there's a lot of pushback. And I agree with that. In using DPN counsel as an example, close to the end of the week, uh, they, we were talking about media points. I literally couldn't even get their attention in the discussion. What was I supposed to do? So what I did was stand up on the table. No kidding, I stood up on the table and started to say my comment. I forget what the point was, but that's what I had to do. It was something about the media, and I don't even remember what it was, but during that time, you know, I had to step out of that predetermined realm of the woman in order to get their attention and make my point. And what was the result of that? Well, I think our predetermined areas are still very much predetermined. And there's a lot of comfort in that. But I am happy to see a lot of women uh, challenge that and change that. Uh, but there's still a lot to be done. And there's a lot of us stuck in that comfort zone. And there's a lot of consciousness building that needs to happen. Uh, go ahead. I would like to see women supporting women. I think that... That would be a huge breakthrough for women. I think oftentimes women tend to hurt each other for whatever reasons. Uh, and men tend not to do that. You know, women will, uh, you know, turn the other way from each other. Uh, I think that if women were to learn how to play the same type of game, uh, if we were able to form that alliance. Uh, I know we have a number of women's organizations now, and, but I still think that they don't get to the root of the problem. I think they are still addressing superficial issues. And it's time that we really support, promote, and help become cheerleaders and cheer each other on. 
And that will lead to another breakthrough for us. I really do believe that. And that ties in with what Jane just said about standing on the table when I asked what was their reaction. You know, I think it's a good moment to, to laugh. <laughs> and I did get their attention. Didn't they think you were batty? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it was new to everyone, but it, it did get my point across. It absolutely did. Uh, at that time, we were getting close to the end, and we were feeling good about things, but we still didn't know the final outcome. And so we, we felt like we were riding this wave that had been building. And we had this cresting wave of media attention. And we were unsure of which way it was going to go. Or when it would come crashing down. And this was an, uh, an opportunity perhaps to bring other issues related to deaf people about deaf education and discrimination, employment discrimination, language oppression. All of that was coming into this building wave. And we were concerned about how to appropriately express that and what moment we had to talk about that. And it was that moment. And the final vote, you know, tell, telling us that we had won. I was actually at the hotel during that, that moment. And <coughs> when we got that information, I told the council. And most of the council um, hadn't gone to the hotel. And so I remember uh, Phil Braven came up and, and said that we had won. And I was looking out at this crowd of people, and it was all men. I was literally the only woman in that room. Was it restricted in any way? Uh, not for me. I just happened to show up because I knew that it was coming close to the vote. The four students weren't there, so I wanted to go and help represent them. And the council wasn't there either. Uh, I, I was sort of their liaison uh, for the media. Yes, yeah, she had to be there. Right, but again, I was looking out at this room of people who had supported the process and the voting and everything, and it was all male. I was the only woman, literally the only woman in this room. And I'm very comfortable with men. I've grown up around men my whole life. I, I have no issue with that. I've, uh, you know, I have no issues being around men, but I just couldn't believe that there was not one other woman in the room with me. I couldn't. I, it was... I had no comrade in arms, you know? I had no one that I could look to and, and have that shared understanding. It was, it was a moment for me, it absolutely was. And I don't think it was intentional, I really don't. I think that uh, it was just uh, what ended up happening. I think that it was the way things, you know, the law of nature that, that all the men came together at that moment and I was the only woman. Was it because there was less interest? I'm sorry, what was your question? Were women less interested? Is that why they weren't there? I mean, why do you think that you were the only woman there? Well, she was there because it was part of her job. She had to be there. But the question is that all of the people who were there, they were the decision makers. That's who was there. So where were the students? Were they there? No, they were not allowed there. It was a board meeting. So there was the board meeting, and then there was all the people waiting for the results of the board meeting. And all of those people waiting for the results were men, except for me. Wow. OK, next question. So I remember the day when they announced that Sinzer was selected. Do you have any evidence that people resisted her selection because she was, in fact, a woman? It's a good question. Yeah, it, it was it is complex. We had this deaf issue, we had the woman issue, it was complex. And I wrote a paper about it. And and like I said, I predicted that the present the that the university would pick a woman before they picked a deaf person, and then they did. So the fact that they did was bad enough, and then it was a hearing woman was really, really patronizing. They didn't pick a deaf person. They didn't pick a deaf man. There were P 60 PhDs at the time. They were all men, granted. But um, so deaf men were absolutely galled at the fact that they had picked a hearing woman over them. 
if it had been a deaf woman, it might have been a little more tolerable. But the fact that it, this was a woman and she was hearing made it just unconscionable. Now, there were some women who said, I don't care. She's, whether she's hearing or deaf, I just care whether this person is qualified. And then, of course, we know what happened. Let me just add to that. The uh, final three, again, we know that we had two deaf and one hearing. I think that was intentional. They chose a hearing woman because they wanted to kind of uh, play up the gender issue. So they picked a woman, and they wanted to play that up and say, look, aren't we progressive? We have a woman president. And I believe that the board did that deliberately. I really do that. I really do. Do you know that for fact? No, I said I believe that. So I think that many of us would have said, or they were expecting that we would have said, okay, it's a woman at least. And I think if it had I think it would be great to have a woman president, absolutely, but it was really a time for having a deaf president, and that was the goal. It wasn't about gender. It wasn't about the fact that she was a woman. It was about the fact that she was hearing. Now you've already talked about this, but could you perhaps talk a little bit more about the role and place of women on campus at, during that time, specifically during the movement? Let's see, that was 1987. And if I remember, Dr. Roz Rosen was the only female administrator. I think, I, I, am I correct in that? We only had one, one woman in an administrative role? Right, we had one white deaf woman in an administrator role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the women just weren't involved in the uh, administration much at that time. What about in general in the, in, in the 80s? What would you say? Deaf women were not in a place to make decisions at that time. I, I, I believe Dr. Rosen was the only one. Well, I'd like to ask more about the place and women, uh, the place and role of women across the world. You know, we could talk about the United States or or outside of the U.S. But just in the 1980s, what was their role and place at that time? They were there in a cooperative and supportive way. That was the role of women, I'd say. I do remember. Dr. Dr. Debbie Sonnenstrahl, Dr. Betty Miller. Uh, Dr. Betty Miller was tough. Uh, she showed our world through her paintings. She showed how it was for many deaf people. She painted about autism and about the deaf experience. She talked about what many of us didn't want to talk about in public. I remember her first art show. People, people were, uh, were aghast at what she was willing to put out there. Uh, but she was, she was willing to do it. She was willing to show that. But I think, in general, women were there just to be cooperative and to be supportive. And she was challenging that. She was speaking out. She wasn't just sitting back. I think in the 80s, a lot of women were moving into the business world. Uh, so we had some role models in, in the 80s, I, I believe. It was really took off in then. Yes, I remember we all had to dress the same. We had to have our little suits and our little skirts. And we had to imitate men and the way that they dressed. We had to cover our necks. Uh, you know, that looked somewhat like a tie. We had, it was our version of the man in the business world. Um, there was not, e it was not even conceivable that management could be done differently by women. Yeah, I think it was, we were trying to think and act like men in the 80s. I think as women have moved up, uh, they don't really take other women with them. They become more male-like. They the glass ceiling during the 80s was a huge issue and a huge conversation. We know that even though uh, women and men may have the same duties on a job, that women still earn less. And that was the case then as well. Women were trying to do a lot to change things.
We also know that if a woman reacted in an emotional way, both men and women looked upon that in a disfavorable way. Okay, so they were torn down. A lot of women spent a lot of energy tearing down other women. Because of that, we have to try even harder. We have to battle all of those perspectives. That's what was going on in the 80s. I remember uh, the days of, uh, let's see, books being written by Steinem, Ferdinand, now Sandberg. I'm just wondering about your thoughts on that. You know, it was a way. And I think that what's really helped, if I can be honest here, is that the male role has changed. We have more men that are stay-at-home dads now. Uh, we have more men who aren't always the breadwinners for their family. So the change has been a slow one, but it is happening, and I think it's happening even more so recently. For a long time, I don't think that change happened at all. But now, again, I think through media, I think through uh, sharing information about how the male role is changing and how women are now changing, especially uh, politically. Hillary Clinton, I, I mean, I've got to say, I am a fan of Hillary Clinton. How she handled uh, Bill's affair, how she, you know, how people look to her with respect. And at the same time, I think we're becoming more verbal with our thoughts. Uh, women aren't sitting back passively any longer. We're no longer limited by the way that people perceive us. We're becoming more vocal and more willing to step outside of that box and we're not intimidated by it any longer. I think the world is finally now listening to women, and I think that they're seeing the woman's perspective differently. It used to be that you couldn't be a mother and be a, a supervisor in an administrative role, and we don't have that limitation any longer. So I think that women truly have come a very long way, a very long way. But I also think that we have a lot to go. <laughs> There's a lot more to do. And, and I think in the deaf community, we are perhaps not as progressive. I don't think we are. You know, in the 80s, there was a terrible issue here with date rape. It was a huge, horrible issue. And that's certainly a manifestation of sexism. And part of that still is here today. Domestic violence is a very much a real issue, and it has been over the years. So we may look all modern and progressive, but if you look underneath, you might find that that's not the case. I think, as Jackie said, we have a long way to go, especially in the deaf community. I think you're right. Uh, let me say this. Um, I work with students a lot. And three years ago, I was in a meeting with student leaders, and I noticed that they were all male. And they were every year, year after year after year. Finally, in these last two years, we have a female leader at the table, and I feel better. This is another example of the fact that we still have work to do. And this is recent. You know, okay, good. We have a deaf president, and that's great. But the presidents of our SPG and the leaders, the editors of Buff and Blue have pretty much been male for many, many years. You know that banner, we still have a dream? You remember, you know, the banner that was used during the march? That was so important. And I was looking at some old pictures and and it made me realize, yes, we do have a dream. And, and we do share that with black people. But if you look at the picture, it's all white people carrying that banner. So what is our dream? How do you define that dream? Is it true equity? Does it include women? Does it include all skin colors? Does it include uh, e economy? Are we just carrying the banner? What are we doing? What does this really mean to us? And that leads to the last question. In thinking about everything that you have said up to this point, what do you think the most important lesson was from DPN for yourself that you think other people need to be aware of? 
Wow, I think hmm, I'll go ahead and start this one off. In terms of a lesson, uh, <coughs> we look at DPN, which happened in, in 1988 and up to the current times of 2013. I think that deaf people have made a number of breakthroughs. You know, we've opened the world's eyes to the deaf community, to our culture. We've seen so many additions and recognitions to the deaf community in these past 25 years, and I hope that we don't lose that. I think that the lesson really is that we can never stop working. We are still a very small community. We are not the masses. You know, the world is a hearing world. And sometimes it's, you know, interested, the hearing world is interested in deaf people in sign language, but DPN's lesson to us truly is that at that time, our message was one of pride, education, collaboration, and that needs to be continued. We cannot stop working now. And I see that we have stopped working. We have become isolated again as a community. We're fighting again for recognition, the same as we did before. The same issues are coming uh, with our community again. And, and I feel like this is what we dealt with in 1988. So uh, I think that would be my message that I would want carried forward. I do agree with Jackie. Now, I happen to have deaf parents. And in 1988, my father was 72 years old and had already retired at that time. He was actually born in the year that uh, EMG retired from Gallaudet. And at the time that EMG passed away, my father was seven years old. And I think that, you know, that wasn't that long ago for us. It really wasn't, if you think about it in those terms. Now, my father did participate in DPN. He participated in the march to the Capitol. He was watching everything that was happening at the time. And once all was said and done, I sat down with him. And he said, I never in my life thought that I would see that. That's a very powerful statement. To me, 1987 was more about empowerment to the deaf community. And I think that we have lost that. We need to remind people about why DPN happened. And we need to carry that reason forward. We need to carry it into our future generations and carry it forward with our children. Again, it's about the power of the media. How do we capture those seven glorious days where we held the attention of the media and we came together and were able to tell the world what was important to us. That was a powerful seven days. It was really a new way of communicating for us. It was, and I think what we could do is learn more about that, about the work that happened and, and, and about what's Jack, what Jackie's talked about as well. Now, unfortunately, we do have to close, but I want to thank all of our panelists here. I hope that what they've shared with us today has had an influence on our audience and that we'll all continue to continue our thinking and continue our work and continue to think about the next future possibilities for deaf women. As was mentioned, I uh, taught a deaf studies uh, course, women's course at NTID. And most of my students were female. I had maybe one male in class. But the role models for these female students were their mothers. Those were the only role models that they had. But we now have so many deaf women role models, including those women here on stage with me. Uh, so I want to thank each of you for your participation in your panel today. It was outstanding. I enjoyed it. <laughs>